12th chapter of the book of Hebrews, and I want to begin reading, well, let's start at verse 12. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down, and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way. Let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you. Thereby many be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Then comes, as far as I'm concerned, the most beautiful declaration of my place, of your place. You're talking about identity. It is there, the remaining portion of this chapter. But I'm going to deal with the scripture verses, uh, well, especially verse 16. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. <clears throat> you do know, you do understand, I hope, that instead of it reading in so many places in your Bible, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. That's a number of places is that recorded in the Bible. In reference to their past history, Israel often referred to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I hope you understand that it should have read Abraham, Isaac, Esau. All right, right. The word profane, we think of, normally think of this as some type of irregular language, profanity. But I want to give you the original meaning of the word profane, where it came from. It comes from the unfenced lands about the temple. There were certain parts of the temple and the tabernacle that was protected, guarded either by walls or curtains, or veils, and then there was that unfenced area. The reason the walls were there, and the veils, and the curtains, was to protect some. And since it was so very important that in the minds of these people, God had so thrilled that if you touch a dead body, or if you touch certain things, or if you eat certain things, you become defiled. And when you're defiled, if you walked on this ground, you would defile that ground. So he said, I've got to have a wall around this. 
Jesus. I've got to see to it that it's not done. I don't want it to be defiled. But that open area, and it was called the profane area. It's, this is the original point. And it means, the word means to the Hebrew, unfenced or unguarded. All right. All right. All right. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Now, give me just a little time. I feel it. I feel good. And everything's going to turn out all right. All right. But I want to plead. I want to talk. I want to exhort. I want to preach. I want to be everything I can to you tonight. With the burden of my heart. Lest there be, he said, you could fail of the grace of God. You could fail. There's no question about it. I don't care what the eternal security fellows say. The book said you could fail of the grace of God. And you could turn out to be a fornicator and profane person such as Esau. I have studied a lot about Esau because it's uh, there's some things that needs to be known. One thing is God said I hate him, uh-huh. All right. and I want to know why because I don't want him hating me. All right. All right. All right. On the other hand, He said I love Jacob, and I'd like to know that because he was some kind of something. All right. All right. Yes, sir. And I want to know how in the world could he love him? Whatever he had, I want that. Right. 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 And uh, so I have tried my best to understand the two boys and their natures and why God hated one and loved the other. And the word fornication does not mean that he was an immoral man. Right. Not at all. That's right. In fact, you don't have record that he was an immoral man or even necessarily, basically, dishonest. Right. Right. He was a good uh, Good home lover. He and his dad were great pals, and uh, and just seemingly a pretty good old boy. Right. On the other hand, Jacob was a cheater. His name meant heel grabber. He came to this world grabbing. Uh, he cheated. He lied. There was a base nature in Jacob that constantly was trying to crop out on him. And uh, there's, there's no telling what he would do. And yet God said, I hate one of them and I love the other. Mm-hmm. It'd be very interesting to find out one. Yes, sir. Yeah. He said, lest that uh, any man fall or fail of the grace of God. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person. For one morsel of meat sold his birthright. Jesus. Profane. Let's start back just a little ways here. And uh, go to the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews and find out, we'll kind of find out from this, how this all got started. It started early in the life of Esau. The Bible said that Abraham, by faith, sojourned in that land that was strange and foreign to him, but he sojourned and claiming every foot of it, by faith, dwelling in tents with Isaac and with Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. Esau wasn't mentioned. Very noticeably left out. Right. Well, in the first place, it is fairly evident. Where did you 
get it, Brother Bean, from imagination. Well, it don't take much imagination. The Bible didn't just come right out and say it in these words, but where was Esau? Dwelling in tents. From the rest of the facts that are recorded in the life of Esau, I gather he was either making him another arrow or already on another hunt. There's yes, no reflection on your hunting. That is, if you don't use all of your weekends for it. I, I lose people from the church during hunting season. They get too carried away. And that's too carried away. That's right. Amen. Oh, it's something anymore. When it comes summer, it's vacation and fishing. Winter, it's hot. When do you ever get them in church? All right. And there's a spirit about it all. And I love, I, I say I do. I used to more than I do now. I don't care as much about it, but I don't see anything wrong with it. Except that you can get a spirit. Right. Yes, you neglect right. God and neglect your soul. That's, right. That's not my point. It is a fact that the boy liked to hunt. Yeah. He spent a lot of time at it. Yes. In fact, that was his main interest. Right. Mm -hmm. main interest. Right. He didn't care as long as he brought in some benzene and mom knew how to fix it and him and dad had sat on the front porch with their feet propped up against the post talking about it and he'd tell him how he killed that buck and how he jumped over that log and dad I got him and more I mean and he just that was the life of Riley for Esau. Yes sir. Right. All right. But Grandpa Abraham is in the tent that's uh, storytelling time. Yes, sir. And Jacob sitting there listening. I can hear him say, Grandpa, tell me that one more time. Now, I know you told it. How God spoke to you and told you to count the stars. But I, if you don't mind, Grandpa, I'd like to hear that one more time. Yeah. All right. That makes my backbone tingle. Yeah. Amen. Papa, what was that now that you said God said? And I see the old man saw interest in that boy, and he began to feel, look, boy, it's hard not to preach to somebody that's showing interest. All right. All right. I'm telling you, I went to Jamaica and some of the foreign countries in South America, and they're nearly kidding. They'll make you preach your silly self to death. Come on, Elder. What a way to go. I preached in a colored church in Miami, Florida, and they come as near, knocking me slap out. <laughs> I was preached till I was exhausted, and an old deacon that J.T. Haywood baptized was sitting on the platform, and he rolled his eyes up at me, and all I could see was the white. All right. And he said, feed me, Elder, feed me. And I started all over again. <laughs> Abraham was listening to the questions of Jacob. He was full of questions. Uh -huh. Outside the tent, a boy was whittling, making another bow. Yes, another sir. Arrow. All right, all right. And all the time it was recorded, it was there that by the law of God and the law of the family and of the tribe, that he was to have the first best blessing. Amen. But you couldn't interest him in one thing about it. All right. All right. He was not interested enough to even dwell in tents with his father Abraham. Oh, but Jacob never let that old man die without hearing the story again. Yes. Something was there, and he understood sometime at a young age that there was such a thing as a God-ordained first blessing. And he called his mama off behind the stove and said, Mama, I don't understand all of this, but I'll tell you what I know. I know by what Grandpa told me that there is a blessing, and it's called the first one. And it's given to the first 
born, and I want you to know, Mama, I'm not taking second place around this house. All right. Huh? Now you figure it out, and you help me, but we're going to get first place. Because I heard Grandpa talk about stars and sand of the sea. And I have to tell you, it's got me excited. Yes, sir. But you could not have called Esau in from his hunt. It mattered not to him what Grandpa was telling. Amen. I'm telling you, it started at a young age. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It started with seemingly childhood innocence. All right. All right. All right, sir. It started with that which could be recognized as acceptable. All right. Let the boy play. Yeah. Uh -huh. Come on, brother. Uh -huh. All right. Oh, God. Oh, Jesus. Jesus. You know the story that if studied your Bible or heard much preaching, it's just simple that Jacob deceived his blind daddy, got the blessing. The blessing could not be pronounced twice, it could not be changed after it was given, and he learned that somewhere. All right. So he got his mama to fix him up with hair on his arm. Uh -huh. And put Esau's coat of the woods on him. Right. And walked in and said, Dad, isn't it about time for the blessing? Uh -huh. And the old man said, Come close, Esau, although I hear the voice of Jacob. Oh, Dad, don't worry. Feel in my arm. Yes, the scent of the woods is on you, son. Uh -huh. That's what the Bible says. Yes, sir. All right. All right. All right. You, you, got, you smell like Esau always smelled when he came in from a hunt. Uh -huh. And your arms are hairy like his, but I can't figure out this voice. It's got me a little confused, but here goes. That's altogether another message. You'd always go with me. All right. Amen. Uh -huh. And the blessing was given. Well, in addition to that, that fellow Jacob, oh, friend, I don't want you to cheat and I don't want you to lie, but I'd give anything in the world if our churches would be baptized with the spirit of Jacob. Hallelujah. All right. And I'd give them, get them up off of their shoulder blades and let us have church. Yes, yes sir. Yes. Oh, God. They wouldn't be sleeping like hoot owls either through the sun. Oh, All right. Brother, that Jacob spirit says, give me the best. Yes, sir. I won't take nothing second. Oh, you don't believe that? Look at his entire life. After he went and found the girl he wanted, why, well, he said, that's her. And I'll get her. Uh -huh. And he worked seven years by contract, and the old man paid him back for some of his dishonesty and handed him Leah that night. And if that had been Esau, well, I guarantee you there'd been a marriage there with plenty of happiness. Yeah. Uh, no well, that would have made him no difference. He'd have probably said, Can you cook Benson and cornbread? Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> Not this boy. <laughs> he said, I'm going to have Rachel if I have to work another seven years for him. Uh, all right. All right. All right. And he got her. Yes, sir. That wasn't all of the story of Jacob. Uh -huh. He decided one day I worked here and hadn't got hardly anything for it. It's time for me to collect a few cows and a few sheep and a few what have you's around here. And he went to his father-in-law and said, Okay, I'll make a deal with you. You've been blessed ever since I've been here, and I'll make a deal. You give me all the calves that are striped and are spotted. Oh, my, that old man, that thought this fellow's going crazy. Well, this is the best deal I ever had in my life. All I got is white grimmers. Yeah. Not a spotted cow in the whole herd. What is in the world wrong with this crazy kid? He didn't know who he was fooling with. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, came time for them old big fat cows to give birth to a calf. He grabbed him a striped pole and put it in front of her. And so help me God, every fat cow in the herd had a striped calf. Yeah. Ah. 
They were clean ones. He said, huh. Yeah. Get out of here. Yeah. Right. He had the finest of the breed before it was all. That wasn't all about Jacob. He met an angel and talked to him. And some of us, that's, we'd stop there and that'd be our testimony for the rest of our lives. But he said, that doesn't satisfy me. Oh, I have to have something more than that. And he gathered his kids together and his family and said, stay here while I go across this brook. I've got to get me more. While he was praying, he went there to pray, sir. Somebody grabbed him in the night, and as far as he knew, it was either Esau or one of the servants, because the angel said he's coming. Uh-huh. Right. And in the middle of that black night, he began to wrestle and fight, and they wrestled all night long. And the book didn't say what we usually say. We usually say that Jacob wrestled with an angel. It didn't say that, and there is a difference. Right. An angel wrestled with Jacob, right. All right. trying to get the cheapness out of him, the usurping nature. Uh-huh. That. Uh-huh. That, that was a very tedious operation God was making that night. Uh-huh. Hallelujah to God. Oh. He was cutting out all the bad and leaving that Woo. desire for better and higher things. In all right. That's a miracle that you can take the cheating out of a man when there's something in him that says, I've got to get ahead. Oh, but God said, I'm going to perform this operation, and I'm going to take all that dirt out of him, I'm going to take all that no countenance out of him, all that rottenness out of him, but I don't want to disturb the part that I love so much, and that's the part that's screaming, give me something better, give me something higher, give me first blessing, give me Rachel, give me that first touch. Wrestling, he's wrestling to become his master. He wanted to be the God of Jacob. I'll either be his God by mastery or I'll be it by choice. I'll not leave this man until I can make claim that I'm his God. And so it looked like they wasn't going to win anything. And he just touched him and, and he's crippled now. He can't fight back. And the angel of God says, I'm going now. Oh, Jesus. Uh, Mr. Angel, have you ever did much flying with a man hanging on your <laughs> coat? <Yeah. laughs> have you ever winged your way around very much with a man hanging on? You're not going nowhere. <laughs> All right. All you right. You bless me. I can't fight. I can't do nothing but cling, but I've got me a... Uh-huh. Clinging hope. Oh, yeah. God. That's the part he loved all the time. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. Jacob is leaning back in his chair. <coughs> let it all go. Uh-huh. Care of uh-huh. Pronounced first blessing. Birthright. Yeah. Inheritance. Which meant it would have been Abraham, Isaac, Esau. Right on. Now oh. he's crying and can't find a place to get him back. All right, my God. And it all came about. And the writer of the book of Hebrews understood what it meant. He understood the meaning of the word profane and where it came from. It meant unfenced or unguarded. I preached a little bit last night to you about the truth of the one God. Uh-huh. Did you catch it? Yes. Amen. Did you understand any about it? Yes, sir. My youngest daughter asked me last night, she's a very modest little girl, don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, extremely careful, but she said, Daddy. I'm not being sarcastic, but what was your point last night? <laughs> Maybe some of you felt the same thing. Uh, but I did preach about one God, didn't I? That's <laughs> Does that mean anything to you? Yes, as far as I'm concerned tonight, there is not a more golden truth. There is not anything more rich and blessed Handed to me is the divine revelation, and it has to 
being a remnant. All right. Quote your Bible backwards and you still don't know there's one God unless he reveals it to you. All right. Divine revelation declares there is but one God. Oh, how beautiful a truth that is to me. Friend, I love it with my life. I love to preach it. I love to hear it preached. I love to hear it sung about. And when saints testify, something goes through me. There it is again. Yes, sir. Amen. Hallelujah. I like the message of baptism in Jesus' name. Don't you? Yes. 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 It's beautiful to me to know that God's name was veiled with titles all through the years. No one, even this man Jacob, asked for his name. And he said, don't ask. It's a secret. And Manoah asked, and he got the same answer. He threw veil after veil over his name. He identified himself with adjective after adjective. But he never did reveal that name until that baby was born in Bethlehem. And when Jesus stood one day, he said, Father, I thank you that you've allowed me to reveal your name. Oh, what a beautiful truth today. That I know what the name of God has always been. And is tonight and will always be. And I know that there's power to heal in that name. And I know there's remission of sins in that name. Oh, I like it, I like it, I like it. Isn't it wonderful that we have been given this? The unsearchable riches. Oh, yes. Almost sometimes it's too big for me. I thought last night I'd nearly go out of my mind when I get anointed to preach this message. Oh, how as simple a message as it is. It is still so powerful and so great. Oh, yes. yes. Brother, Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. I love to see people excited about it. Yes. yes. Amen. I don't know if you know Molly Thompson from South America. She is some more something. She was doing the interpreting for me in their church in Bogota one night. And uh, I was preaching on one gun. That is her favorite subject. Molly is a good interpreter. She does a marvelous job. You don't have to wait on her normally. She does not have to stagger for the word to fit what you're saying. But I waited on her that night. I was preaching one God and there's no telling what that woman told her. <laughs> she got so excited she forgot what I said and everything else and went to saying it herself. Oh, I like it. Oh, I love it. Glory to God. Isn't it beautiful? Beautiful. Yeah. Wouldn't you hate to know a heavenly committee did all of this? Wouldn't you hate to know the Father sent the Son with the Father having the same capabilities as the Son? It almost makes me mad. Aren't you glad to know that the only God there was came in human flesh to the world? Aren't you glad to know there's salvation in no other name? For there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Aren't you glad that you're not stammering tonight and stuttering and making amends and excuses for tongue talking? You're just talking in them and enjoying them a minute of it. Even those that have accepted tongues have accepted it with a bunch of ifs and buts and ands. Friend, don't come here with all of that hogwash. There's nothing that I want to add to or take away from it. The book said with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people to whom he said this. Is the rest. All right. And this is 
is the reference. Oh! Isn't it a beautiful knowledge that I do not have to go through some Greek pub, some mess yeah. trying to explain the new birth away. Oh, I am so happy to yeah. tell you tonight that St. John the third chapter yes. does not mean some far away something. What? It simply means if a man is born of baptism and is born of Holy Ghost, yeah. he'll see the kingdom. Yeah. Otherwise, he'll never see it. That's a beautiful truth, isn't it? Yes. Hallelujah. Isn't the principles of the doctrine of Christ beautiful? Yes. yes. Somebody said, why don't you get away from them? Paul said, leave him. We better get them first. Yes. Before we leave them, we better get them. told it in my life, we were so poor, the poor looked down on us. Alright. Alright. Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, it was bad. <laughs> I wore old tennis shoes I got out of the garbage that didn't have a sign of a spring or a tongue in them, and no socks, and them old boys that had their fine lunch kits, and all them sandwiches with lettuce sticking out all around. Mine was in a shirt bucket, and if you ever eat a bunch of soggy biscuits that had a hole punched in them and syrup poured in them, and then them put in a bucket to get mushy and salt and watery, they'd say, where's your tongue, son? And I'd stick them back up under the chair, shame. Oh, hallelujah. The richest day of my life was when those old preachers would come to our house. Not often. We couldn't afford a preacher. We had a revival one time in our community in Alabama. The only offering the man got was a thin dime. So they couldn't let very many preachers come on that salary. Once in a while, they'd feel sorry for us and drive up there and spend the day. There was no play that day for me. We weren't allowed to talk when adults were there. Didn't have enough chairs to go around. Apple boxes run out and I'd sit on the floor. And they'd tell about God talking to them to go pray for Brother So-and-so and got over there and Sure enough, he was asking God to send somebody, no telephones or cars, and got over there, and God healed, and then tell another one, and another one, and another one about his healing, and how he did this, and did that, and then they'd say, well, we better go, and I want to say, oh, don't go, tell, tell me one more time about him healing. All right. That's what I thought he'd do. That's kind of a sweet God I thought he was. Reinforce it again. Tell me once more. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Yes. Praise, Praise the Lord. I'm glad for the message of divine healing. Yes. Don't walk on it. Don't downgrade it. All right. Just because you've got no faith, don't push everybody in the corner that's trying. Right. 
In fact, I am not even obligated to accept you if you don't come on the terms that you are going to encourage faith whether you have it or not. All right. The Bible said them that are weak in the faith receive, but not until doubtful disputation. Don't come disputing the fact that God heals or doesn't heal. All right. Or else we are not obligated to accept your weakness. Come with your hands surrendered to weakness and say, I'm sorry, I haven't got it, but I know he'll do it, and I'm glad you're holding on. Oh, my life for those times when I was privileged to be with certain men that knew how to pray. Oh, yes. I don't know if you, any, many of you knew old brother Joe Duke or not, but some of the sweetest times of my life is when I would walk in to that old blind man that he couldn't tell I was there. And I'd walk in the auditorium and slip over in the corner. I didn't go there to pray. I went to hear him. And that old man would walk around there talking to God like he had a friend. You know, it just, there he was. It just, yeah. just, he'd say, Father, now I'd like you to come tonight and do this and take care of that. Now, Father, would you mind taking him in? And they talked all day long, did yeah. And oh, yeah. how beautiful it was. I'm glad somebody influenced my life to want to go to a prayer room. Amen. Yeah. Somebody talked about praying. Uh, somebody inspired this boy's heart. I was laughing with an old preacher. I don't say this hardly now if it sounds boastful. I didn't mean it that way. But I didn't have good sense when I was a kid. I, I'm sure I didn't use wisdom and hardly anything I did. But I thought you were supposed to pray all the time. And uh, we were in the thicket, Texas. And I stopped by the old preacher's house the other day. I hadn't seen him in, oh, I guess 15 years I stopped by and, and we laughed about it. I was during, during war time, the tires didn't have any. We needed to leave early that morning before it got too hot and the old tires started blowing out to get over to Louisiana. But uh, didn't go without praying. I went down in the orchard and I sat down on the ground and I started praying. I thought you were supposed to pray till God spoke to you and told you to quit. And, uh, I kept waiting for that voice and that would come at 12 o'clock hot burning sun and, and I didn't know anybody was near but uh, it came to my mind you need to go to the house they're probably waiting on you and and I had just a silly kid I didn't know no better and I said God the devil wants me to stop I know he does but I'm not listening to him, and old Brother Lofton had walked up behind me. They had sent him down there to get me, and uh, see if he could get me to come to the house. And he said he got right up close and was fixing to make uh, make it known that he's close by. And about that time, my back was to him. I didn't see him. I didn't know he was anywhere around. And about that time, I said, God, the devil wants me to stop praying. He but I don't, I'm not going to let him stop me. <laughs> that old man just went back to the house. His mother said, you get him? He said, no, and I ain't going to get him. <laughs> I'm not letting the devil use me like that. <laughs> whatever, whatever mistakes I made, and however lack of wisdom I used, so wherever it came from, thank you, God, that, that something was, was stirred in my heart to pray. I'm glad to know that that's a great part of the heritage and the plan and the program. That is to pray. Yes, yes. It's a beautiful thing that from my childhood, with anticipation, I've waited for his return. Folks, you may not believe that what I'm saying is very important because it is the principles of the doctrine. Yes. Let me say this before I finish this. I was laying in, in bed sick one day, and I, I mean, I was feeling bad. And I said, all right, God, I'm not going to ask you to heal me. I'm going to declare what I believe and see if there's any power in it. See if there's any goodness. See if there's any effects to be had from it. And I said out loud, instead of pleading for help, I just said, okay, God, 
I am telling you now that I believe in the resurrection of the dead. I believe in the second coming of Jesus Christ for the catching away of his bride. I believe in the cleansing power of the blood of Calvary's cross. I believe that the name of Jesus is the name by which my sins are remitted in baptism. I believe that there is but one God and his name is Jesus and there is none other. I believe in the virgin birth. And before I finished the role of faith, I was well. I'm telling you, there is power in the confession of your faith. Committed him to my trust are these beautiful truths. And then somewhere, we buried just, just before I came up here, Saturday, I was delayed in leaving to go and bury a fine old preacher, old brother Joe Cofty, passed from this life, and he played a very, very important part in my life. I would drive with him for miles and say, Brother Cofty, tell it to me again. I don't understand certain parts of holiness. It's no use for me to say that I've always preached what I preached tonight. There was a time I did not see it necessary. I cannot preach it just because I heard it preached. All right. I, my, my very makeup won't let me. And I cannot force myself because it's public opinion. All right. Or because the association of my friends. All right. Or because it would be a popular message. I cannot, I will not, I will never do it. And I'm sorry, but that's the only way I know to do Right. And stay honest with this fellow. Right. Right. So I would say, sir, I don't understand it. You haven't cleared it yet. But tell me again. And over and over he would tell the story. And give his side of the issue. And quote his scriptures. And I'll never forget. I was sitting at the Louisiana camp meeting one year. And the thing that I questioned him about had never been settled. I just couldn't settle it. I was sitting there one day listening to a preacher preach. The anointing was on me. Oh, what can come from the anointing? All right. Did you know that while a man's under the anointing, you may get a revelation about something different totally than what he's even preaching? When the anointing comes, the yoke is broken. The anointing will bring revelation. Just the presence of anointing will bring revelation. While I was sitting there, the anointing on that man of God, all of a sudden, as simple as it could be, it opened to me. Uh -huh. Why hadn't I seen that all beautiful? All right. Uh -huh. Thank you, Lord, and you couldn't shake me away from it. Uh -huh. By the grace of God, I had it. It took me a long time to get it, but I got it now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right. Hallelujah. Praise God. Now here's what I want to talk about. These things that God gave us are not left up to our jurisdiction as to what is important and what is not important. Everything he handed me was valuable or he wouldn't have let me have it. Friend, this message of Jesus' name is not to be mixed with anything. The one God is not to be contaminated with anything. I said, the name of Jesus is not to be mixed up with anything. I don't want you messing with it. The message of holiness. No, mess with it. Amen. Oh, the glorious truth of the coming of the Lord. And believe me, friend, that message is challenged tonight. Yes, it is. Uh -huh. I've lost saints over the message of the second return. Yes, sir. Jesus' name was preaching that it is not that way. Uh, oh, Hear me. I never thought that would ever be challenged. Right. But the devil will challenge any of it here. Yeah. All right. 
Now here's what the apostle to the Hebrews is saying to you and I tonight. Esau had to him committed certain glorious facts. He had an inheritance. He had a birthright. But in his lackadaisical, in his earthly mind, he did not guard it. He did not want to hear Grandpa Abraham. He didn't want to know the story. It was unimportant to him. His life was that lackadaisical leisure. Don't care. And it started way back there in his childhood and it developed until it matured to the point that he sold it for one bowl of punch. Now the thing that he did according to the means that what God had given him to guard, he did not guard. He let the fence down. He took the guards away. All right. It was unimportant to him. Peace means more than a message. Peace at any cost. Let's have love at any cost. Let's get along and to do that we're going to have to shovel things around and pull some walls down and jerk some bales off and, and, and unloose some curtains from the rod. And let it be open and unfinished. The devil has brought on his army and pushed it back in the corner. Until, friend, we've got very little that's finished anymore. I've got friends that I preach for that who ain't ever think I said that tonight all I know they're holding to is one God in baptism in Jesus' name. The rest of it's fences are down and the curtains are off. I'm not so careful tonight of what I'm telling you because my heart bursts within me. I have wept and there is hardly no tears to weep. It is not fun. It is not an exciting thing. Some folks seem to enjoy the fact that everybody's backsliding so they can get a message on it. I do not enjoy being called a hard preacher. I will not boast. I will not bring it to the level of carnal, carnal things. I hear men say it, and I'm saying this kindly, but, but they reduce this message and the preaching of it to such carnal terms. All right. High busting and, and yeah. yeah. Come on, brother. Yeah. Go on with your little slang words about it, but I was too scared. I didn't. Right. What I'm preaching, I'm preaching to the saving of the souls of me. All right. I am not joying over how many I run off and how many I hurt. And bless God, I cut them down. Friend, I have no such pleasure. But I tell you what I do have pleasure in, that which was committed to me. I am obligated to guard it with everything in me. I am set in the defense of the gospel. I become the wall to the truths of my heart. My will becomes the curtains that guard that which was given to me by revelation. And you're not going to mess with it, sir. I can't depend on William Garrett to do it for me. I said my will is the curtain around the revelation of my heart. Something about me is committed to me. It's committed to me. Hear me? I'm the wall of the truths of my heart. I cannot depend on some AML for some IMA or some whatever else. It doesn't matter. That is not my guards. I've got this in the pine settling thicket. I've got it by questioning preachers. I've got it with tears. I wore holes in the pages of this old book trying to understand it. And friend, don't come here messing with it now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, you can leave the gate open if you want to. You can pull the fence all down and go your way and play the game with the rest of them. But so help me God. I'm going around checking my fence. See if there's anything loose. I'm checking mine to see if there's any boards rotting out. And 
going to say it tonight. I'm going to say it tonight in the name of Jesus and plead with you. The most ridiculous thing you can do that I can't find of a more serious charge in the Bible. And that is for a man to be called profane. I mean, profane, that's a bad word. That's a bad word in this Bible. God, don't ever let it be named over this man. Let me be unpopular and let my number be few. But God, don't brand me and say as that fornicator, as that profane person, Martha Bean, that I gave a message of holiness to. I gave him the revelation of one God. I gave him the truth of baptism. And he let it down and he pulled his guards down and he let the walls down and, and that which was defiled walked across it. I don't say this unkindly either, but I've had my offers, and I'm not even boasting because I don't consider it anything to boast about. All right, almost insults me. I've had them come by and say, "Did you? We've got you picked for a citywide revival if you'll just well, the term they use if you'll just keep your nose clean." Yeah. I know what they meant. Yeah, sure. I've done that all my life, even when I didn't have a hatchet. Use uh, my sleeve. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 they were saying, if you're just a boy, in certain issues. Preach, Come on. I was sitting on one day in my room and said, why don't you preach some of these good sermons? And, and that's his words now. On prayer and faith and these goods. They have a way of branding them that are not controversial goods. Yeah. Yeah. And whether they are or not. Why well, don't you preach to them? He said, every time you fellows get up, you slam everything you know at them. Well, we know that's the last round. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Yeah, All right. I like I'm not screaming from bitterness tonight. Yeah, no. I know what the touch of bitterness would do for a man. I've seen it. God warned me in a vision. It wasn't a dream. I saw it in a bright, broad, open light. I was not asleep, but he showed me the danger of bitterness and whether it can come to you. I said, even defending truth, it can come to you. You become as bitter as gall, defending truth. But on the other hand, I'm sick of this, that every time a man preaches a message, he's called bitter. That's a devil. Come on! He's trying to turn a wall down. He's All getting right. down. I'm not right. a pretense. And you're too bitter. Thieves. You're too bitter. Thieves. Why don't you quit being bitter? I don't know how nothing to do with him. I'm he's right. bitter. You know why he's bitter? Because he's repairing his walls. He's holding his revelation under the curtain. He's got it under the veil. And he's got it under the walk of God. While the rest of them take their pulpits and open it up to the sharp skirting girls and the jewelry girls and go over there. Preach all of their people. Don't tell me that I've done it. I've seen it. Oh, uh, they told me about a message of preach, preacher priest. Not long ago, it sounded so good I wanted to have a fit and I lost my faith. Wait a minute. This has troubled me more than anything I know of. Would you please consider it? I don't guess there's a day goes by that this doesn't trouble me. I can't preach without mentioning it. The writer said that if you are hearers of the word and not doers, you deceive yourself. Uh -oh. Come on. The greatest deception I've ever known is in the land tonight. Because if that Bible is true, Brethren, you can get to where you rally to what I'm saying tonight simply for old times' sake. Not to. You can rally to it because it's your ball team and it's your player. Uh, that's right. And not do one thing about what uh, uh, And when you've done it, you deceive yourself. Deceive yourself. You deceive yourself in this manner. Oh, say, see, we still got a prison. See, we still hold it. Hold it. Nothing. Look at all them short skirts. Yeah. Look at all that world. Yeah.
come on. It's a wearisome job. All right. It's an unpleasant task. Mm -hmm. I'm not requiring this of you, but I have a little standard in my church that a woman has to wear a dress four inches below the bottom of her knee. Wonderful. Wonderful. All right. I don't want to say you have to do it. That's the way I feel it needs to be done. All right, Lord. Bring him down. And friend, I'm going to tell you something. That's not an easy task. Uh, Even the godly saints that have been there for years will get curious. Yeah. Gain a little weight. And see if you'll do anything about it. Don't you ever kid yourself. After I mention it a time or two, I warn them. And I say, now next, I'm coming to you. And the secretary of the church has been there for years, one of the oldest saints. I walked up to her one day. I said, that dress is too short. All right. All right. I like no, it. Brother Bean. That's, yeah. no. That's what their mothers felt. That's the right spirit. They felt the pressure of that same thing. Yeah, come on. And they said, let it go. Oh, God. Let let mercy. Mercy. Let's get into the big swing of uh-huh. push and numbers and revivals. Oh. And there's not a man here that believes in that more than I do. Uh-huh. I believe in end time revival. I believe you'll see 3,000 in one day before Jesus comes. But it won't be in some hippie camp where they stay hippies. And it won't be in some mini-skirted camp where they stay that way. I give everybody a chance to repent. I give them all a chance to buy a new wardrobe. I don't require the change overnight. But I'll tell you what, when they've been in the church for years, they ought to have learned something. <laughs> and I am the watchman on the wall in my church. And I've got to guard this thing. It's holy. It's sanctified. The revelation of holiness is just as great a revelation yes. as any other part yes. of the world. Yes. 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 Yes.
still something in him that wanted to say, young man, I'm tired of building fences. Would you come help me? All right, all right. Rather than sit here and watch it go back to the world and become a profane preacher in his day, he said, young man, would you take it over? I say, God bless him. I said, God bless him. If you're feeling weary, please don't, don't give to that. Try to renew yourself, and if you can't, for God's sake, don't tear down the labor of years. Right. 
Don't do awful attention. Don't push one area of this or you'll fall in fairly. Every divine healer that ever walked has fallen some time or other into false doctrine. Because they pushed only one area. If you'll bring a hold of this up here to where you can see it good. If you'll bring church government up here where you can see it good. If you'll bring Jesus' name baptism up here where you can see it good. Not leaving anything behind. I say the sky is the limit. God is still a God of higher life. But friend, don't do it at the cost of holiness. Are you for faith? Who in the world it can come? It means unguarded and unfit. Joshua, the 
this man said, To whom shall it go up from us, and who shall stand before this holy God? David said, Well, we'll ride the owners, I'll come get it. Thirty thousand soldiers he arrayed and went after it, shot them having a fit one night after another. And he built him a little cart like the Philistines' cart, put it on it, and here it come rolling into town, and all of a sudden, boom. His little excitement stopped. The man was dead. He was angry. God went on. To the house of Obadiah, and he checked on it later, and Obadiah was getting more blessings than he'd ever had in his life. He said, man, I want that thing. And he was the rightful owner. But he checked to see how it was to come home, and found out it was to be born on the bare shoulders of the priest. And he got it coming home right. This time, read it in your Bible. He had it on the bare shoulders of the priest. They walked a few paces, stopped, and offered sacrifice. Walked a few paces, stopped, and offered sacrifice. The historians say that the streets of Jerusalem flowed with rivers of blood that day. I'm going to bring it home right. Now, I'm saying that Luther brought us to justification by faith and said, I can't handle the Lord. Get it out of here. The Methodist brought us to holiness, praying for the sick, falling out into the power, and even talking in tongues. And they said, that's all we can handle. Get it out of here. It went on, and finally the assembly of God got a hold of it, and he knew to. Did you know that the assembly of God introduced the necessity of speaking in tongues, and the gifts of the Spirit, all nine of them, taught them fully in every respect? But when that day came, the revelation of the name came, said, get it out of here, we don't want it. Now then these brethren stepped to the forefront and said, we're the rightful owners of the ark. We're bringing home the original doctrine of the New Testament church. So let's go get it. And they went shouting all around the country and having big revivals. And all of a sudden, boom. I said that Jesus' name one God, folks. Hit a stone. Yeah, I say this with all kindness, and if anybody charges me, you do it on your own. I say it in kindness. Old Brother Robert the Floor in Louisiana stood publicly and said, I made a mistake through my whole early ministry. I do not see in any of my past whims of God, any of it. I do not see the complete restoration of the early church. Thank God for everything back there, and I've not had what they had in the power. But I do not see the restoration of the church. I see only segments. Brother, they did not have church government. Brother, the floor, they would go into a town, pray 200 through, and walk off and leave the whole shebang without even a pastor. That is not church government. I'm not throwing off on them. I'm not being unkind to them. Dear God, I've made many, so many mistakes. I'm just saying, we have arrived at a time that would be the greatest hour to completely restore the New Testament church there ever was. Right. We are conscious of the need of the Bible ministry. In other words, it don't need to be on the modern cart. It needs to be on the bare shoulders of the Bible ministry. Right. Right. Hear me, if God's going to do anything, he'll do it to a preacher. Right. Right. When I say that, I say it. I need to say it more carefully. That's about all we've got now as preachers. That's a blob. That's a conglomeration. God help us to identify that this is a pastor and this is a teacher and this is an evangelist and this is a, an apostle and they are the alive today apostles. So help me God. And God wants that part on the fivefold ministry and nothing else. Any other modern card won't do. Right. Amen. All right. I'm not here fighting nobody. All right. I had a good friend of mine. Still a good friend. He said, Brother Bean, as a certain officer in a certain church, I've done a lot for God. I said, man, if you've done anything, you did it through a ministry. Don't come here substituting carts for me. God, God's plan cannot be improved upon, sir. When he said, my fingers I'll use, that's all I need. You know, you look at other people sometimes and almost think, well, they're better off than I am. They've got more than I've got. Some of those fellows in Old Testament times could have looked at those men that had six toes and six fingers and said, he's got more than i got. But so have they got that six finger might have been in the way. I know it'd be in mine. Yeah. You little fellows running along here trying to do it without all this. No, I don't need a six finger. God said five. Uh -huh. Five. We are at 
the stage, the setting of the stage for the greatest move of God that's ever been. We believe holiness. We're walling the place up with it. <laughs> we believe the new birth. We believe in divine healing. We believe in church government. Man, we're ready. You know what we lack? By the time we evolve to the point where all of these things were revealed and needed and solved and revealed into our hearts, they the seer came on. A man that I'm talking to that believe all of this, if they're not careful, will sway under the pressure of the seer. And I'm concerned like a daisical spirit that says, we're increased with goods and have needed nothing. I've got to quit. I don't even know what time it is. Bring me up. Please, my sweet Jesus. Oh, my sweet Jesus. Oh, my sweet Jesus. Please come to us tonight. And don't let this little group of men become profane. Have this church become profane. Let the fences of truth and revelation fall and be walked upon. Oh, God, I pray. Jesus, Waits on tonight. I don't want to be me. I commit myself to this service. If 
while we wait on the Spirit and I want Him to speak so bad. I love to hear His voice today. Can I appeal to your good mind, sound thinking, that by the law of comparisons I can take that law tonight and prove that living stuff is right and not sinful. By the law of comparisons, I can prove that playing cards is not wrong. By the law of comparison, I can prove that rolling dice is not simple. But it costs you have become so intelligent that you make comparisons, and as a result, you are losing your decision. Oh, God. For instance, a man tells me one time, what's the difference between hitting a ball from the side of a stick or from the end of it? Technically, there is none. There is no way you could prove that there's any difference. And you can't. Don't even try. But what he was doing was justifying pool tables in his saints' hall. Technically, a man said to me one time, what's the difference in extracting a gallbladder or extracting a tooth? None. None. But when I used that law of comparison, I just lost my faith. Yes, Themselves with themselves. Nothing looks bad. A man out of my church went to center man, went to an old friend, the preacher and his wife, starting a new church in Houston. Walked in unexpected to them, and the wife walked in from a play, and she had a little, little bitty skirt that was open. Choice. Really, she was wearing choice. No remorse, no conscience, nothing bothers. And the center man came home disappointed. I'm so scared of trends because I seek where they wind up. Brother, if you've got a job on your hands teaching people to avoid trends because you can't hardly pinpoint. All right. Jesus, I know it's late. I know the people are tired. And God only knows what you're thinking about me. But all in the world I'm doing tonight in Tennessee is pleading with you. Please don't weaken our ranks anymore. My heart's been torn apart yes, many times. Jesus, Jesus. I've watched them fluff their hair in the wind. I've watched them. Oh, I thought they'd stop with the spray hand, but they didn't. They said, we're going to go on and style it. Ah, God, my God. Don't kid yourself. Jesus. They're styling it now. But God. With their white patent leathers and their hair sprayed, they could stand in a 40 mile meal backwards and want not one hair and move. And it's fluffed. I saw one of my old time preacher friends the other day I hadn't seen in a long time. Here was that. And he had on maroon patent leathers, almost a snow white suit, and his head looked like it was three times what it used to be. So styled and fluffed. And I happened to know I preached him a revival, and he was firm and hard and stylish. I can't help it. Oh, God. Talk to us, Elder. Yes! Talk to us. Do that. 